So Chris Hedges, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk about the culture of war. Uh, and it is an honor to be here with Tom and Ann, who come out of that great radical tradition that my father came out of and that the Presbyterian Church is either going to recapture uh, or uh, watch itself fade into oblivion. Um, it, it is uh, that tradition which comes closest to the radical message of the gospel, which uh, we now, in a time of crisis, so desperately need. The vanquished know war. They see through the empty jingoism of those who use the abstract words of glory, honor, and patriotism to mask the cries of the wounded, the senseless killing, war profiteering, and chess pounding grief. They know the lies the victors often do not acknowledge, the lies covered up in stately war memorials and mythic war narratives filled with stories of courage and comradeship. They know the lies that permeate the thick, self-important memoirs by amoral statespeople who make wars but do not know war. The vanquished know the essence of war, which is death. And they see that war is a state of almost pure sin with its goals of hatred and destruction. They know how war fosters alienation, leads inevitably to nihilism, and is a turning away from the sanctity and preservation of life. All other narratives about war to easily fall prey to the allure and seductiveness of violence, as well as the attraction of the godlike power that comes with a license to kill with impunity. But the words of the vanquished come later, sometimes long after the war, when grown men and women unpack the suffering they endured as children, what it was like to see their mother or father killed or taken away, or what it was like to lose their homes, their community, their security, and be discarded as human refuse. But by then, few listen. The truth about war comes out, but usually too late. And we are assured by the war makers that these stories have no bearing on the glorious, violent enterprise the nation is about to inaugurate. And lapping up the myth of war and its sense of empowerment, we prefer not to look. We who prosecute these wars in the Middle East do not see war. We view the conflicts through the distorted and heavily censored prism of the troops who fight the war, the equally skewed perspective of the foreign reporters who can rarely reach or give a voice to war's primary victims. All our knowledge of the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the proxy wars in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and Syria have to be viewed as lacking the sweep and depth that will come one day, perhaps years from now, when a small boy or girl caught in the maw of war reaches adulthood and unfolds for us the sad and tragic tale of senseless violence and senseless death. Those who use violence to shape the world, as we have done in the Middle East, unleash a whirlwind. Our initial alliances achieved at the cost of hundreds of thousands of dead, some three trillion dollars in expenditures and the ravaging of the infrastructure across the region have been turned upside down by the cataclysm of violence. 13 years of war, and the rise of enemies we did not expect, have transformed Hezbollah fighters inside Syria, along with Iran, into our tacit allies. We are intervening in the Syrian civil war to assist a regime we once sought to overthrow. We promise to save Iraq 
and now help to dismember it. We have delivered Afghanistan to drug cartels and warlords who preside over ruin of a nation where 60% of the children are malnourished and the Taliban is poised to take power once NATO troops depart. The entire misguided enterprise has been a fiasco of gross mismanagement and wanton bloodletting. But that does not mean it will be stopped. More violence is not going to rectify the damage. Indeed, it will make it worse. But violence is all we know. Violence is the habitual response by the state to every dilemma. War, like much of modern bureaucracy, has become an impersonal and unquestioned mechanism to perpetuate Western power. It has its own internal momentum. There may be a few courageous souls who rise up within the apparatus to protest war's ultimate absurdity, but they are rapidly discarded and replaced. The state rages like an insane King Lear, who in his madness and desire to revenge himself on his two daughters and their husbands decides that it were a delicate stratagem to shoe a troop of horse with felt. I'll put in proof, and when I have stole upon these sons-in-laws, then kill, 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 kill. And kill, 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 kill is the mantra chanted with every new setback in the Middle East. How many times have we rejoiced at the murder of those we demonized? Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, and dozens of others. But as soon as one hunt for the fountainhead of evil ends, another begins. Those we kill are swiftly replaced. Fresh terrorist groups take the place of the old. The Khorasan group, we are told, is a more sinister and deadlier version of the Islamic State of Iraq and Greater Syria, which was once touted as a more sinister version of Al-Qaeda. We cannot extinguish our enemies. They spring out of the ground like the legions of hostile warriors that rose up when Cadmus sowed his dragon's teeth. Our violence spawns violence and never-ending configurations of enraged militants. And we will keep spawning them until we stop occupying the Middle East. The horrific pictures of the beheading of American reporter James Foley and other hostages, the images of executions of alleged collaborators in Gaza, and the bullet-ridden bodies left behind in Iraq by the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant are the end of a story, not the beginning. They are the result of years, at times decades, of random violence, brutal repression, and collective humiliation the United States, Israel, and Israel has inflicted on others. Our terror is delivered to the wretched of the earth with industrial weapons. It is to us invisible. We do not stand over the decapitated and eviscerated bodies left behind on city and village streets by our missiles, drones, and fighter jets. We do not listen to the wails and shrieks of parents embracing the shattered bodies of their children. We do not see the survivors of air attacks bury their mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters. We are not conscious of the long night of collective humiliation repression and powerlessness that characterizes existence in Israel's occupied territories, Iraq and Afghanistan. We do not see the boiling anger that war and injustice turn into a cauldron of hate. We are not aware of the very natural lust for revenge against those who carry out or symbolize this oppression. We see only the final pyrotechnics of terror the shocking moment when the rage erupts into an incohate fury and the murder of innocents. And willfully ignorant, we do not understand our own complicity. We self-righteously condemn the killers as subhuman savages who deserve more of the violence that created them. And this is a recipe for endless terror. Haim Engel, 
who took part in the uprising at the Nazis' Sobibor death camp in Poland, described what happened when he obtained a knife and confronted a German in an office. The act he carried out was no less brutal than the beheading of Foley or the executions in Gaza. Isolated from the reality he and the other inmates endured, his act was savage. Set against the backdrop of the extermination camp, it was understandable. It's not a decision, Engel said. You just react. Instinctively, you react to that. And I figured, let us, do, let us go and do it. And I went. And I went with a man in the office. And we killed this German. And with every jab, I said, this is for my father, for my mother, for all these people, all the Jews you killed. No one, except for perhaps a few psychopaths, wakes up wanting to cut off another person's head. And this includes one fifth of the world's population who are Muslims. Murder and other violent crimes almost always grow out of years of abuse of some kind suffered by the perpetrator. And even the most civilized among us are not immune to this dehumanization. The enemies on battlefields in the Middle East are elusive. Death is usually delivered by industrial weapons such as aerial drones or fighter jets that are impersonal or by insurgent forces that leave behind roadside bombs or booby traps or carry out hit and run ambushes. The inability of Sunni fighters in Iraq to strike back at jets and drones has resulted in their striking back at captured journalists and aid workers, at Shiite and Kurdish civilians. What we do not see, but what those in the Middle East see every day, is that US soldiers and Marines in the occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as the Israeli soldiers in Gaza, engage in the same kind of brutality. They routinely gun down unarmed civilians in revenge killings for members of their unit who have been lost, as the Golani Brigade in Israel did during the most recent assault in Gaza. It is no more rational than beheading a hostage. Those murdered were not responsible, even indirectly, for the deaths of the killer's comrades, just as Foley and the Shiites and the Kurds executed in Iraq were not responsible for the death of Sunni militants hit by the US Air Force. But this impulse to extract revenge, to trade death for death, is part of the sick pathology of war. J. Glenn Gray, who fought in World War II, wrote about the peculiar nature of revenge in the warrior's reflections on men in battle. When the soldier has lost a comrade to this enemy, or possibly had his family destroyed by them through bombings or through political atrocities, so frequently the case in World War II, his anger and resentment deepen into hatred. Then the war for him takes on the character of a vendetta. Until he has himself destroyed as many of the enemy as possible, his lust for vengeance can hardly be appeased. I have known soldiers who were avid to exterminate every last one of the enemy, so fierce was their hatred. Such soldiers took great delight in hearing or reading of mass destruction through bombings. Anyone who has known or been a soldier of this kind is aware of how hatred penetrates every fiber of his being. His reason for living is to seek revenge, not an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth but a tenfold retaliation. Those killed are not, to the killers, human beings, but representations of what they fear and hate. The veneer of the victim's humanity, they believe, is only a mask for evil. The drive for vengeance, for tenfold retaliation, among those who are deformed by violence, cannot be satiated without rivers of blood even innocent blood. And we do as much of this type of revenge killing as those we fight. Our instruments of war allow us to kill from a distance, but this does not make us any less depraved. The curse of endless war 
which we have embarked upon and which results in endless terror, leaves the arms manufacturers and generals giddy with joy. It is a boon to the state, which is possessed of an excuse to extinguish what few liberties we have left in the name of combating terror. It fuels the militancy and hatred that fanatics need to justify their slaughter and attract recruits, but it is a curse to humankind. We have become hostages to complex bureaucratic mechanisms that profit from the perpetuation and manufacturing of death. And no one in the political establishment seems capable of doing anything more than chanting Lear's insane mantra. The soul that is enslaved to war cries out for deliverance, Simon Weil observed. But deliverance itself appears to it an extreme and tragic aspect, the aspect of destruction. Thus war effaces all conceptions of purpose or goal, including even its own war aims, she wrote. It effaces the very notion of wars being brought to an end. Consequently, nobody does anything to bring this end about. In the presence of an armed enemy, what hand can relinquish its weapon? The mind ought to find a way out, but the mind has lost all capacity to so much as look outward. The mind is completely absorbed in doing itself violence. Always in human life, whether war or slavery, whether war or slavery is in question, intolerable sufferings continue, as it were, by the force of their own specific gravity. And so look to the outsider as though they deprived the sufferer of the resources which might serve to extricate him. Violence, as a primary form of communication, has become normalized. It is not politics by other means. It is politics. And Democrats are, are as infected as Republicans. <clears throat> the war machine is impervious to election cycles. It bombs, kills, maims, tortures, terrorizes, and destroys as if on autopilot. It dispenses with humans around the globe as if they were noisome insects. No one dares lift his or her voice to protest against a war policy that is visibly bankrupting the United States, has no hope of success, and is going to end with new terrorist attacks on American soil. We have surrendered our political agency and our role as citizens to the masters of war. In endless war, it does not matter whom you fight. Endless war is not about winning battles or promoting a cause. It is an end in itself. In George Orwell's novel 1984, Oceania is at war with Eurasia and allied with East Asia. The alliance then suddenly is reversed. Eurasia becomes an ally of Oceania and East Asia is the enemy. The point is not who is being fought. The point is maintaining a state of fear and the mass mobilization of the public. War and national security are used to justify the surrender of citizenship, the crushing of dissent, and the expanding of the powers of the state. The point is war itself. And if the American state, once a sworn enemy of Hezbollah, gives air cover to Hezbollah fighters in Syria, the goals of endless war remain gloriously untouched. We have blundered into nations we know little about, caught between bitter rivalries, between competing ethnic and religious groups. We have become tyrants to others weaker than ourselves. And we believe falsely that because we have the capacity to wage war, we have the right to wage war. Once you master a people by force, you depend on force for control. Isolation always impairs judgment, and we are very isolated now. In Antigone, the king imposes his will without listening to those he rules and dooms himself. Thucydides wrote of how Athens' expanding empire led it to become a tyrant abroad and then a tyrant at home. The tyranny Athens imposed on others, it finally imposed on itself. <clears throat> 
the lust for war, the desire for profits, saw the Athenians lose sight of the ideals that were their great gift to us, ideals that should be our legacy to others. We live on images and slogans that perpetuate fantasies about our own invulnerability, our own might, our own goodness, and these illusions blind us. We cannot see ourselves as others see us. We have become pariahs. We are propelled forward, not by logic or compassion or understanding, but by fear. We had fed the heart on fantasies. William Butler Yeats wrote, the hearts grown brutal from the fair. The attacks on the World Trade Center used to justify endless war illustrate that those who oppose us, rather than coming from another moral universe, have been schooled well in modern warfare. The dramatic explosions, the fireballs, the victims plummeting to their deaths, the collapse of the towers in Manhattan were straight out of Hollywood. Where else but from the industrialized world did the suicide bombers learn that huge explosions and death above a city skyline are a peculiar and effective form of communication? They have mastered the language we taught them. They understand that the use of indiscriminate violence against innocence is a way to make a statement, and we leave the same calling cards. We delivered such incendiary messages in Vietnam. It was Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara who in the summer of 1965 defined the bombing raids that would kill hundreds of thousands of civilians north of Saigon as a means of communication to the communist regime in Hanoi. And this is how we communicate throughout the Muslim world. War is not an abstraction for me. I have spent much of my adult life in war. I began three decades ago covering the wars in Central America, where I spent five years, and the Middle East, where I spent seven, and the Balkans, where I covered the wars in Bosnia and Kosovo. My life has been marred let me say deformed, by the organized industrial violence that year after year was an intimate part of my existence. I have watched young men bleed to death on lonely Central American dirt roads and cobblestone squares in Sarajevo. I have looked into the eyes of mothers clutching the lifeless and mutilated bodies of their children. I have stood in warehouses with rows of corpses, including children, and breathe death into my lungs. I carry within me the ghosts of those I worked with, my comrades, now gone. The seduction of war is insidious. It appears to be a way to eradicate our enemies, to banish from the world of the living those who would do us harm, and at a time when we are afraid, it gives us a false sense of power and security. After our defeat in Vietnam, we became a better nation. We were humbled, even humiliated. We asked questions about ourselves we had not asked before. We were forced to see ourselves as others saw us, and that sight was not an attractive one. We were forced to confront our own capacity for atrocity, for evil. And in this, we understood not only war, but ourselves. But this humility is gone. War is seductive. It is the pornography of violence. It has a dark beauty filled with the monstrous and the grotesque. The Apostle Paul called it the lust of the eye and warned believers against it. War gives us a distorted sense of self. It gives us meaning. It creates a feeling of comradeship that obliterates our alienation and makes us feel, for perhaps the first time in our lives, that we belong. War allows us to rise above our small stations in life. We find nobility in the cause, feelings of selflessness, even bliss. 
Once in a conflict, the shallowness of much of our lives becomes apparent. The fruitless search to find fulfillment in the acquisition of things and wealth and power is laid bare. The trivia that dominates our airwaves is exposed as empty chatter. War allows us to engage in lusts and passions we keep hidden in the deepest, most private interiors of our fantasy life. It allows us to destroy not only things, but human beings. And in that moment of wholesale destruction, we wield the power of the divine, the power to revoke another person's charter to live on this earth. The frenzy of this destruction, and when unit discipline breaks down, or there was no unit discipline to begin with, frenzy is the right word, sees armed bands, crazed by the poisonous elixir our power to bring about the obliteration of others delivers. All things, including human beings, become objects, objects to either gratify or destroy or both, and almost no one is immune. The contagion of the crowd sees to that. Force, writes Vile, is as pitiless to the man who possesses it, or thinks he does, as it is to its victims. The second it crushes, the first it intoxicates. And those who have the least meaning in their lives, the impoverished Palestinian refugees in Gaza, the disenfranchised North African immigrants in France, even the legions of disaffected youth in the splendid indolence and safety of the industrialized world are all susceptible to war's appeal. I do not miss war, but I miss what it brought I could never say I was happy in the fighting in El Salvador, or Iraq, or Bosnia, or Kosovo, but I had a sense of purpose. And this is a quality war shares with love, for we are also able to choose fealty and self-sacrifice over security for those we love. And this is why war, at its inception, always looks and feels like love, the chief emotion war destroys. The ancient Greeks understood the perverse attraction between love and death in wartime. When Achilles killed Penthesilea, the queen of the Amazons in the Trojan War, he fell in love with her as she expired on the battlefield. He murdered love, and once he murdered love, he was doomed. He courted death. Aphrodite, the goddess of love, had an illicit affair with Ares, the god of war who was hated by the other gods, with the exception of the god of the underworld, to whom he steadily brought new souls. We feel in wartime comradeship. We confuse this with friendship, with love. There are those who will insist that the comradeship of war is love, the ecstatic glow that makes us in war feel as one people, as one entity, is real. But this is part of war's intoxication. Wartime always brings with it this comradeship, which is the opposite of friendship. Friends, as J. Glenn Gray points out, are predetermined. Friendship takes place between men and women who possess an intellectual and emotional affinity for each other. And many of us will admit that we never really had a friend, and even the most fortunate of us have very few. But comradeship, that ecstatic bliss that comes with belonging to the crowd in wartime is within our reach. We can all have comrades. The danger, the external threat that comes when we have an enemy does not create friendship. It creates comradeship, and those in war are deceived about what they are undergoing. This is why once the war ends, these comrades again become strangers to us, and this is why after war we fall into despair. In friendship, there is a deepening of our sense of self. We become, through the friend, more aware of who we are and what we are about. We find ourselves in the eyes of the friend. Friends probe and question and challenge us to make each more complete. They draw the secrets out of us and know our inner core of being. For we reach and change others, and we are changed when we plunge to the depths of our inner life, 
The depths that expose our insecurities, our incompleteness, those depths that often lie beyond articulation. In comradeship, the kind that comes to us in nationalistic fervor, there is a suppression of self-awareness, self-knowledge, and self-possession. Comrades lose their identities in wartime for the collective rush of a common cause, the common purpose. In comradeship, life is ecstatic and corporate as opposed to friendship, where life is singular and individual. In comradeship, Gray reminds us there are no demands on the self, and this is part of its appeal, and one of the reasons we miss it and seek to recreate it. Comradeship allows us to escape the demands on the self that are part of friendship. And this is why once the war is over, once the danger that linked us together is past, these feelings are extinguished. Sebastian Hoffner, who was a lawyer in Nazi Germany, wrote of this comradeship in his book, Define Hitler. He noted that comradeship destroys the sense of responsibility for oneself, be it civilian or worse still, the religious sense. Comradeship always sets the cultural tone at the lowest possible level, accessible to everyone, he wrote. It cannot tolerate discussion. In the chemical solution of comradeship, discussion immediately takes on the color of whining and grumbling. It becomes a mortal sin. Comradeship admits no thoughts, just mass feelings of the most primitive sort. These, on the other hand, are inescapable. To try and evade them is to put oneself beyond the pale. In wartime, when we feel threatened, we no longer face death alone, but as a group. And this makes death easier to bear. We ennoble self-sacrifice for the other, for the comrade. In short, we begin to worship death. And this is what the god of war demands from us. Think, finally, of what it means to die for a friend. It is deliberate and painful. There is no ecstasy. For friends, dying is hard and bitter. The dialogue they have and cherish will perhaps never be recreated. And friends do not, the way comrades do, love death and sacrifice. To friends, the prospect of death is frightening. And this is why friendship, or let me say love, is the most potent enemy of war. We thrill, as a culture, in the perversity of war, even as we watch films or read books that are meant to denounce war. It is almost impossible to produce anti-war films or books or documentaries that also present images of battle. The prurient fascination with violent death overpowers the message. Vietnam War films are all pro-war, wrote Anthony Swafford in Jarhead, his memoir of the Persian Gulf War. No matter what the supposed message, what Kubrick or Coppola or Stone intended. Mr. and Mrs. Johnson in Omaha or San Francisco or Manhattan will watch the films and weep and decide once and for all that war is inhumane and terrible. They will tell their friends at church and their family this. But Corporal Johnson at Camp Pendleton and Sergeant Johnson at Travis Air Force Base and Seaman Johnson at Coronado Naval Station and Specialist 4 Johnson at Fort Bragg and Lance Corporal Swafford at 29 Palms Marine Corps Base watch the same films and are excited by them. Because the magic brutality of the films celebrate the terrible and despicable beauty of their fighting skills. Fight, rape, war, pillage, burn. Filmic images of death and carnage are pornographic to the military man. And it doesn't matter how many Mr. and Mrs. Johnsons are anti-war. The actual killers who know how to use the weapons are not. War is part of the modern industrial landscape. Indeed, its tools are often the cutting edge of technology. By World War I, we had created ways in which thousands of people who never saw their attackers could die in an instant. And weapons that carry out this impersonal mass slaughter are crafted, sleek, and harbor within them awesome power. The machines of war 
the planes, the tanks, the heavy machine guns, the huge hulking howitzers and the helicopters are pieces of art. I have seen them at work. They are angels of death streaking through the sky. I was with a unit of guerrillas in El Salvador when some Huey helicopters raced in over a lake to hunt us down. We hid in the ruins of an abandoned village, darting from wall to wall and standing with our backs to the shattered bricks so our hunters could not see us as they passed low overhead. As I looked up at these machines that were trying to kill me, I found them strangely beautiful. Once we are in a conflict, once we live in the midst of combat, we are moved from the abstract to the real, from the mythic to the sensory. No soldier or marine, after even a few seconds of combat, believes in the myth of war anymore. And this is why wounded Marines jeered John Wayne when he visited them in a hospital in World War II. When this move takes place, we have nothing to do with a world not at war. The world, when we return to it, is viewed from the end of a very long tunnel. There they still believe. There they do not understand. And we feel different, wiser, greater. And this experience is so overpowering that if we can control our fear, we go back to seek it out again. War is addictive, indeed. It is the most potent narcotic invented by humankind. The first time I was in an ambush was in the Salvadoran town of Suchitoto. It was a dreary peasant outpost made up of stucco and mud and wattle huts off the main road. The town was surrounded by the Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front rebels who, when I arrived in El Salvador, were winning the war. The government forces kept a small garrison in the town, although its relief columns were frequently ambushed as they ambled down the small strip of asphalt surrounded by high grass. It was one of the most dangerous spots in the country. The rebels launched an attack to take the town. A convoy of reporters in cars marked with TV and masking tape on the windshields hightailed it to the small bridge that led to the lonely stretch of road into Suchitoto. Then we moved slowly down the road, the odd round fired ahead or behind us. We made it to the edge of town where we ran into rebel units, now accustomed to the follies of the press. And on foot, we moved through the deserted streets. The firing from the garrison became louder as we weaved our way with rebel units to the siege that had been set up. Then, as I rounded a corner, Several full bursts of automatic fire rent the air. Bullets hit the mud wall behind me. We dove into the dirt. The rebels I was with began to fire noisy rounds from their M16 assault rifles. The scent of cordite filled the air. Rebels around me were wounded, crying out in pain. One died, yelling in a sad cadence for his mother. The firefight seemed to go on for an eternity, I cannot say how long I lay there. It could have been a few minutes, it could have been an hour. Here was war, real war, sensory war, not the war of the movies and novels I had consumed in my youth. It was horrifying, confusing, numbing, and nothing like the myth I had been peddled. I realized at once that it controlled me. I would never control it. In a lull, I made a dash across an empty square to find shelter behind a house. My heart was racing. Adrenaline cursed through my bloodstream. I was safe, and I made it back to the capital, where, like most war correspondents, I soon considered the experience a great cosmic joke. I drank away the fear in a seedy bar in downtown San Salvador that night. Most people, after such an experience, would learn to stay away. I was hooked. Drawn into the world of war, it becomes hard to escape. It perverts and destroys you. It pushes you closer and closer to your own annihilation, spiritual, emotional, and finally physical. <clears throat> 
It destroys the continuity of life, tearing apart all systems, economic, social, environmental, political, that make community possible, that sustain us as human beings. This fragile web of interconnectedness is what gives life, but war is about death. I covered the war in El Salvador for five years, and by the end, I had a nervous twitch in my face. I was evacuated three times by the embassy because of tips that the death squads planned to kill me, and yet each time I came back. I accepted with a grim fatalism that I would be killed in El Salvador. I could not articulate why I accepted my own destruction and cannot now. There came to be a part of me, maybe it is a part of all of us, which decided I would rather die like this than go back to the dull routine. During the war in El Salvador, I worked with a photographer who had a slew of close calls and then called it quits. He moved to Miami for Newsweek, but life in Florida was flat, dull, uninteresting. He could not adjust and came back. From the moment he stepped off the plane, it was clear he had returned to die. And just as there are some soldiers or war correspondents who seem to us immortal, and whose loss comes as a sobering reminder that death has no favorites. There are also those in war who are locked in a grim embrace with death from which they cannot escape. It was frightening to behold a walking corpse. He was shot through the back in a firefight and died in less than a minute. Sigmund Freud divided the forces in human nature between the Eros instinct the impulse within us that propels us to become close to others, to nurture, to preserve, to conserve, and the thanatos or death instinct, the impulse that works towards the annihilation of all living things, including ourselves. And for Freud, these forces were in eternal conflict. And for this reason, he was pessimistic about ever eradicating war. All human history he argued in civilization and its discontents as a tug of war between these two instincts. Taste enough of war, and you come to believe the Stoics were right. We will, in the end, all consume ourselves in a vast conflagration. There is a constant search in war to find new perversities, new forms of death, when the initial flush fades, a rearguard and finally futile effort to ward off the boredom of routine death. And this is why we would drive into towns in Bosnia and find bodies crucified on the sides of barns or decapitated and mutilated. This is why those slain in combat are treated as trophies belonging to the killers turned into grotesque pieces of performance art. I met soldiers that carried in their wallets the identity cards of men they had killed. They showed them to you with the imploring look of a lost child. In war, we deform ourselves, our essence. We give up individual conscience, maybe even consciousness, for the contagion of the crowd, the rush of patriotism, the belief that we must stand together as a nation in moments of extremity, to make a moral choice, to defy war's enticement, can be self-destructive. But in the rise to power, we always become smaller. Power absorbs us, and once power is obtained, we are its pawn. As in Shakespeare's Richard III, the all-powerful prince who molded the world, we fall prey to the forces we thought we had harnessed. Love may not always triumph, but it keeps us human. It offers the only chance to escape from the contagion of war. Perhaps it is the only antidote, and there are times when remaining human is the only victory possible. When the mask of war slips away, and the rot and corruption is uncovered, when it turns sour and rank, when the myth is exposed as a fraud, we feel soiled and spent, and it is then we sink into despair. In the Arab-Israeli 1973 war, almost a third of all Israeli casualties were due to psychiatric causes, and the war only lasted a few days. <laughs>
A World War II study determined that after 60 days of continuous combat, 98% of all surviving soldiers will have become psychiatric casualties. A common trait among the 2% who were able to endure sustained combat was a predisposition towards, quote, aggressive, psychopathic personalities. During the war in El Salvador, soldiers could serve in the army for three or four years or longer, virtually until they psychologically or physically collapsed. In garrison towns, commanders banned the sales of sedatives because of the abuse by troops. In this war, the emotionally maimed were common. I once interviewed a 19-year-old Salvadoran army sergeant who had spent five years fighting and suddenly lost his vision after his unit walked into a rebel ambush. The rebels killed 11 soldiers in the firefight, including his closest friend. A couple dozen soldiers were wounded. He was unable to see again until he was placed in an army hospital. I have these horrible headaches, he said, sitting on the edge of his bed. There's shrapnel in my head. I keep telling the doctors to take it out. But the doctors told me he had no head wounds. I saw soldiers in other conflicts go deaf or stop speaking or simply shake without being able to stop. War is necrophilia, and this necrophilia is central to soldiering, just as it is central to the makeup of suicide bombers and terrorists. The necrophilia is hidden under platitudes about duty or comradeship. It waits, especially in moments when we seem to have little to live for and no hope, or in moments when the intoxication of war is at its pitch to be unleashed. When we spend long enough in war, it comes to us as a kind of release, a fatal and seductive embrace that can consummate the long flirtation with our own destruction. In Milo Vangelis' memoir of the partisan war in Yugoslavia, he wrote of the enticement death held for the combatants. He stood over the body of his comrade, the commander Sava Kovekovic, and found dying did not seem terrible or unjust. This was the most extraordinary the most exalted moment of my life. Death did not seem strange or undesirable. That I restrained myself from charging blindly into the fray and death was perhaps due to my sense of obligation to the troops or to some comrade's reminder concerning the tasks at hand. But in my memory, I returned to those moments many times with the same feeling of intimacy with death and desire for it while I was in prison especially during my first incarceration. Endless war is not sustainable. States that wage endless war collapse. They drain their treasuries, are hated by the wretched of the earth, and militarize and strangle their political, social, and cultural life while impoverishing and repressing their populations to prosecute war. They are captive to the death instinct. Edward Gibbon observed about the Roman Empire's own lust for endless war. The decline of Rome was the natural and inevitable effect of immoderate greatness. Prosperity ripened the principle of decay. The cause of the destruction multiplied with the extent of conquest. And as soon as time or accident had removed the artificial supports the stupendous fabric yielded to the pressure of its own weight. The story of the ruin is simple and obvious, and instead of inquiring why the Roman Empire was destroyed, we should rather be surprised that it had subsisted for so long. War, ascendant, wipes out eros. It wipes out delicacy, tenderness, its communal power renders the individual obsolete. It hands all passions, all choice to the crowd. When we see this, when we see our addiction for what it is, when we understand ourselves and how war has perverted us, life becomes hard to bear. John Steele, a cameraman who spent years in war zones, had a nervous breakdown in a crowded Heathrow airport after returning from Sarajevo. He understood the reality of his work, a reality that stripped away the self-righteous, high-octane gloss. 
I came back from Sarajevo, he said. We, we were in a place called Sniper's Alley, and I filmed a girl there who had been hit in the neck by a sniper's bullet. I filmed her in the ambulance, and only after she was dead, I suddenly understood that the last thing she had seen was the reflection of the lens of the camera I was holding in front of her. This wiped me out. I grabbed the camera and started running down Sniper's Alley, filming at knee level the Bosnians running from place to place. A year after the war in Sarajevo, I sat with Bosnian friends who had suffered horribly. A young woman, Liliana, had lost her father, a Serb, who had refused to join the besieging Serb forces around the city. She had been forced a few days earlier to identify his corpse. The body was lifted, the water running out of the sides of a rotting coffin from a small park for reburial in the central cemetery. She was emigrating for Australia soon where she told me, I will marry a man who has never heard of this war and raise children that will be told nothing about it, nothing about the country I am from. Liliana was young, but the war had exacted a toll. Her cheeks were hollow, her hair dry and brittle, her teeth were decayed, some had broken into jagged bits. She had no money for a dentist. She hoped to fix them in Australia. And yet all she and her friends did that afternoon was lament the days when they lived in fear and hunger, emaciated, targeted by Serb gunners on the heights above. They did not wish back the suffering, and yet, they admitted, these may have been the fullest days of their lives. They looked at me in despair. I knew them when they were being pounded by hundreds of shells a day, when they had no water to bathe in or wash their clothes, when they huddled in unheated flats as sniper bullets hit the walls outside. But what they expressed was real. It was a disillusionment with a sterile, futile, an empty present. Peace had again peeled back the void that the rush of war, of battle, had filled. Once again, they were, as perhaps we all are, alone, no longer bound by a common struggle, no longer given the opportunity to be noble, heroic, no longer sure of what life was about or what it meant. The old comradeship, however false, had vanished with the last shot. Moreover, they had seen that all the sacrifice had been for naught. They had been, as we all are in war, betrayed. The corrupt old communist party bosses who became nationalist overnight and got them into the mess in the first place had grown rich off their suffering and were still in power. There was a 70% unemployment rate. They depended on handouts from the international community. They understood that their cause, once as fashionable in certain intellectual circles as they were themselves, lay forgotten. No longer did actors, politicians, and artists scramble to come and visit during the ceasefires, acts that were almost always ones of gross self-promotion. They knew the lie of war, the mockery of their idealism, and struggled with their shattered illusions, and yet they wished it all back, and I did too. A year later, I received a Christmas card. It was signed, Liliana, from Australia. It had no return address. I never heard from her again. But many of those I worked with as a war correspondent did not escape. They could not break free from the dance with death. They wandered from conflict to conflict, always seeking one more hit. By then I was back in Gaza and found myself pinned down in another ambush. A young Palestinian, 15 feet away, was shot through the chest and killed. I had been lured back, but now felt none of the old rush. Just fear. It was time to break free, to let go, to accept that none of this would or could or should return. I knew it was over and I was lucky to get out alive. Kurt Schork, brilliant, courageous, driven, could not let go. He died in an ambush in Sierra Leone, along with another friend, Miguel Gil Moreno. His entrapment 
His embrace of Thanatos, of the death instinct, was never mentioned in the sterile and antiseptic memorial service staged for him in Washington. Everyone tiptoed around it. But for those of us who knew him, we understood he had been consumed. I had worked with Kurt for 10 years, starting in northern Iraq. Literate, funny, it seems the brave are often funny. He and I passed books back and forth in our struggle to make sense of the madness around us. His loss is a hole that will never be filled. His ashes were placed in the Lions Cemetery in Sarajevo for the victims of the war. I flew to Sarajevo and met the British filmmaker Dan Reed. It was an overcast November day. We stood over the grave and downed a pint of whiskey. Dan lit a candle. I recited a poem the Roman lyric poet Catullus had written to honor his dead brother. By strangers' coasts and waters, many days at sea, I come here for the rites of your unworlding, bringing for you the dead, these last gifts of the living, and my words, vain sounds for a man of dust, Alas, my brother, you have been taken from me. You have been taken from me and by cold chance turned to shadow and my pain. Here are the foods of the old ceremony appointed long ago for the starvelings under the earth. Take them. Your brother's tears have made them wet and take into eternity my hail and my farewell. It was there, among 4,000 war dead, that Kurt belonged. He died because he could not free himself from war. He was trying to replicate what he had found in Sarajevo, but he could not. War could never be new again. Kurt had been in East Timor and Chechnya. Sierra Leone, I was sure, meant nothing to him. Kurt and Miguel could not let go, and they would be the first to admit it. Spend long enough at war and you cannot fit in anywhere else, it finally kills you. It is not a new story. It starts out like love, but it is death. War is the beautiful young nymph in the fairy tale that, when kissed, exhales the vapors of the underworld. The ancient Greeks had a word for such a fate, ek pyrosis. It means to be consumed by a ball of fire, and they used it to describe heroes. Thank you.